Hey everybody, what's going on? I am Dr. Alexia, um, triple board certified infectious disease physician, breast cancer survivor thriver, cancer health and wellness coach, and medical director for BRCA Strong. Hey Tracy, how are you? Today I am covering in the absence of our wonderful founder, Tracy. She's not feeling well, so I'm asking you guys to lift her up in prayer and send her good vibes and healing energy today. Today we're going to be talking with Dr. Alejandra Ergel. Um, I'm just waiting for her to come into the space, but before she joins us, I'll let you guys know that we will be talking about triple negative breast cancer, um, talking about the progression of the disease, talking about what distinguishes triple negative breast cancer from other forms of breast cancer, because we know that breast cancer is not a single disease or a single diagnosis, but it is many um, different types of breast cancer. And so we'll be talking about triple negative, uh, which has quite the reputation and rightfully so. But I think it's important for our TMBC survivors and thrivers and metavivors to be able to get on and get um, re-educated or more education about this topic. Um, thank you, Cherry. And to, um, you know, hear what the new developments are and not just hear about them and not just share our stories because our own individual advocacy and, and storytelling at, helps. It absolutely helps those in the community. But sometimes we just need to hear it from the experts. And as a medical professional, I will tell you that I am the queen of staying in my lane, right? Um, I'm an infectious disease doctor. I could talk to you all day and night from my point of view and from my professional expertise about all things infection and how infection might um, complicate cancer and how we can decrease our infectious risk when we're entering into surgery or deal with infections if they arise during our cancer treatment, right? That's totally my lane. But today we get to hear from an expert and our expert is coming on um, about cancer. So it's my absolute pleasure um, to welcome on Dr. Alejandra Ergo, and we'll um, hear from her. Hey, Doc, how are you? Hi, hi. It's um, Dr. Gaffney, right? Yes, how are you? You can call me Alexia. I'm here in the, the patient survivor, breast cancer thriver capacity, and this is your stage today. We absolutely are excited to have you on. We're looking forward to hearing from you. And I was saying just before you came on, um, this is your lane, right? This is your area of expertise. This is what you do every day and how you serve the world and how you serve the breast cancer community. So we're so excited to hear more about you, what you do every day, and then really dig in on this conversation about triple negative breast cancer. Yeah, yeah. Happy to be here. Thank you. So I'll give you an opportunity just to introduce yourself, um, explain to us a little bit about what you do as a hematologist, oncologist, and then we'll get into the questions about triple negative breast cancer. Yeah. Um, so my name is Dr. Um, Ergel. I work here at Memorial um, Cancer Institute, specifically the Breast Cancer Center in Memorial Hospital West, uh, which is in uh, Pembroke Pines, Florida. I don't know how, how wide our audience is. It's <laughs> all just... over. Yeah. Um, so I, I treat specifically uh, breast cancer. I see some patients who are at high risk for breast cancer without otherwise a diagnosis of breast cancer, but otherwise specifically breast cancer. Um, I also, we just got a new fellowship program. So through them, I see some general oncology as well, but my focus is breast cancer. Uh, we have a very um, uh, diverse patient population here in South Florida. Um, a lot of Caucasians, um, uh, a large proportion of which um, uh, are Ashkenazi Jewish population who are, have BRCA mutations, um, a lot of Hispanic population as well, um, and African Americans as well. And uh, BRCA is, you know, as I was saying, associated with the Ashkenazi Jewish population and African Americans. So we, we tend to see it quite a bit, um, and that includes triple negative. Mm -hmm. So, I will say from the patient perspective um, and from the advocacy perspective, when we hear triple negative breast cancer, it's kind of one of those diagnoses um, where you're in a room and you hear somebody has triple negative breast cancer. There's like this huge response around it. And unfortunately, it's generally a very 
negative response. And th that tends to be related to the fact that unlike um, hormone receptor positive cancers, there's no additional treatments or therapies um, beyond the surgery, the chemo and the radiation. So we'd love for you to talk more about like the natural progression of triple negative breast cancer. Explain to those of us in our audience who may not even understand what that means um, yeah. because we're coming from different places of experience and people are at different stages of their diagnosis or they may just be someone who's at risk. So could you tell us more about that? Yeah, um, so um, to clarify, triple negative, what that means is there are three receptors that when a patient's diagnosed with breast cancer for the first time, and we always test for those because those tell us not only about the overall progression and kind of, you know, natural history of the disease, but also what treatments um, the, the patient um, has available to them. And these three receptors are the estrogen uh, receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 receptor. And if a patient happens to be positive for any of those three receptors, that means that we have additional targeted treatment that targets one of those, one or more of those receptors. Um, and sometimes this means that the patient may not need chemotherapy um, in the case of uh, a good proportion of the estrogen positive, estrogen progesterone positive receptors. Um, and in the case of HER2 positive uh, breast cancer, we have anti-HER2 therapy, which has made a dramatic um, um, change in the treatment and, and prognosis of HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, so like you were saying, for triple negative, by definition, they are negative for all three receptors. Therefore, we don't have targeted uh, treatment, or we haven't had, should I say, because part of this um, part of this discussion today is to kind of discuss some of the changes that have luckily happened. Um, so yeah, so you know, historically, we haven't been, we haven't had any targeted treatment for triple negative breast cancer, um, which means that we have to use chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is treatment that is, you know, I like to think of it as a shotgun approach. You know, it kills all dividing cells, but it focuses on breast cancer cells because breast cancer cells uh, reproduce much more quicker. So it's it's much more effective in killing uh, cancer cells in general. Um, so for triple negative, historically, it's just been chemotherapy um, as, as the option for systemic therapy. And whether that is metastatic disease, um, in which case patients are kind of um, committed to a lifelong chemotherapy, um, or whether that is local, localized disease, in which case if the, if, the, if the tumor is greater than usually five millimeters is our cutoff, um, we, we give chemotherapy after surgery uh, with the purpose of reducing the risk of recurrence. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so historically, you know, it's, 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 it's been a little bit of, as you were saying, you know, it has this, this connotation of bad news because there's no targeted therapy that has been available. Um, on top of that, uh, triple negative breast cancer uh, tends to be more aggressive, meaning right. that the, the, the cancer cells grow quicker. Um, a lot of uh, triple negative breast cancer patients, they present not because it was caught on routine mammogram, but because they actually felt a mass that was, you know, not there a couple months ago and all of a sudden it's growing quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so triple negative breast cancers usually tend to present more advanced stages. Um, and a lot of the times it's either a large tumor in the breast uh, and, and or it has um, spread to the lymph nodes. And unfortunately, in some cases, it's also spreads to other organs in which, it would be, in, in which case it would be a stage four. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a little bit of the natural history. You know, when, when I meet my, my uh, triple negative breast cancer patients nowadays, I, I tell them, that it's, it's uh, there are pros and cons to being triple negative if you mm -hmm. were to compare it to, to non-triple negatives. Um, I've already mentioned some of the downsides, um, you know, the, the um, uh, less, less treatments available and generally uh, percent with a, in more advanced stages. Um, a big silver lining of triple negative, and this was a study that was a few years ago, is that um, because they, it is otherwise so responsive to chemotherapy, it's more responsive to chemotherapy than non-triple negative. Mm -hmm. um, 
then for those patients that are able to be cured with, with surgery, and then we give chemo to reduce that risk of recurrence, chemo is very effective. So it has been found that for triple negative breast cancers, the, the, if, if patients don't, the, if the cancer does not recur within the first five years, um, the risk of recurrence is much less compared to other um, uh, breast cancer subtypes. So that's a, that's a huge silver lining. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's fantastic news. And um, that's a, a wonderful takeaway. You know, I, I like that you approached it with there's pros and cons, because there's pros and cons to everything, including our diagnoses, there's good and bad things. And I think it's human nature to highlight the negative or point out the negative, or, you know, say, this one has the good one, this one has the, the bad one, mm -hmm. everything has pros and cons. Um, so it's a wonderful approach that you took to presenting that information. Um, and that's the first time I've heard that about triple negative breast cancer, that it's less likely to recur in five years, because I know in, in the breast cancer world, we sort of, you know, hinge our piece on this five year mark um, in terms of risk for recurrence, but we know, unfortunately, many women will recur even after five years of remission or NED. Right. And so um, if there's a talking point, I think we need to highlight the positives. And that's a wonderful piece of news to be able to share with those of us who may not have known that in the community, especially in the triple negative community, that the, the risk of recurrence after five years is less than other cancer subtypes. So thank you so much for how you presented that information and for, um, you know, just highlighting that, that one point. I think every yeah. little bit of good news and positive news we can have is so important to have along the way. Yeah. So thank and you the, for that. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that that, positive is closely linked to the initial negative you know it's the fact that it's so aggressive mm -hmm. basically the more aggressive a cancer is the more it responds to chemo mm -hmm. um so it's it's tightly linked to that well that's good to know also yeah. because um you know when you talk about um black women for example right we are more likely to have aggressive cancers we're more likely to have triple negative cancers um, and more likely to have advanced stages of the illness. And so, again, it's another piece of information that's always negative, negative, negative. Um, so if it's more aggressive, the cells are dividing more rapidly and more responsive to chemo, like you said, I think that's something um, important for us to share and be aware of in the community because, yeah. you know, beyond needing our wonderful doctors and surgeons and our treatments, we need hope and we need, you yeah. know, something positive to um, hang on to, or we need those positive reminders about what could be working in our favor over the course of our treatment. So that's yeah. great news to hear. Um, so what about the relationship to triple negative breast cancer and G mutations, like BRCA G mutations, which you already brought up? Yeah. Um, so just kind of backtrack a little bit. Triple negative is, um, I forgot to mention, it's a minority of all the breast cancer subtypes. It's about 15% um, of all breast cancer subtypes. And within triple negative, there's been uh, a strong association with uh, specifically BRCA1 um, mutations. Uh, there's some BRCA2, but the strongest associations with BRCA1. Um, and about 10 to 15% of triple negative breast cancer patients will have a BRCA1 mutation. Uh, there, recently, there was another study that uh, discovered other genes that are, are not as strongly linked as BRCA ones, but there's other genes that are strongly linked to um, to triple negative. Uh, one of those is the PALB2 gene, which is the next most common one. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, they're they're, they're linked, and uh, we see these a lot more in African American women mm -hmm. and Ashkenazi Jewish um, mm -hmm. women. I think in African American women, it's a, once uh, an African American woman has, has been diagnosed with breast cancer, it's about a 30, 30 35 percent chance that um, she'll have a BRCA uh, one mutation. And for Ashkenazi Jewish population, that uh, that um, almost reaches fifty percent. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the stakes are high and, you know, that highlights the importance of having genetic testing 
um, which unfortunately African-American women um, in some settings are offered less often than our white counterparts. Um, and even when patients bring it up, sometimes they're sort of talked out of it or dismissed or told they don't have the right family history. So uh, I think knowing that 30% of black women and 50% of Ashkenazi Jewish women um, carry these genes mutations, that's at least information where if someone's in the setting where they're not being offered this information, they're not being offered genetic testing, or they've been, been declined when they've presented the option, the numbers don't lie. And it's yeah. important for us to have the facts to be able to advocate for ourselves. You know, yeah. I requested gene mutation uh, testing and was told I was not a candidate for it. And only after my breast cancer diagnosis did I find out that I was a PAL-B2 mutant. So yeah. um, the, the numbers don't lie and, you know, people cannot deny statistics. And if our yeah. providers aren't speaking from um, the data, from the facts, from statistical standpoints, um, I think it's important for sometimes for us to not accept that information and for us to be em empowered um, when we're going into the healthcare setting. So thank you for those very specific statistics and numbers, how um, triple negative cancer can be related to race, race ethnicity, and yeah. what the link is to gene mutations in those scenarios. Yeah, and a, lo a lot of that um, has changed actually within the past month. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you have triple negative, um, the 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 um, recommendation for gene testing. Oh, we'll take a a pause and wait for Dr. Ergel's screen to catch up with us. Um, you were can can I request that you start over what you were saying? You were saying that that information has been updated. In yes, the past sorry. Month? Okay, yes, sorry. You. I lost you for a second. I think we're yeah. running out of battery. Okay. <laughs> Logistical difficulties. All right. Listen, technology is a gift and a curse, but we will wait for you because you're giving us wonderful information today. Um, so we'll definitely wait on you. Yeah, no, no worries. We're, they're just helping me get something to plug this into. Okay. All right, everybody, hold tight. Just be patient with us. Um, we're always dealing with the gift and the curse of technology, right? When it's running perfectly and smooth, it's a fantastic thing. But sometimes it gets a little twitchy on us. And so we just hold the course. So we'll just wait for um, Dr. Ergel to come back on the screen with us. But I'll just give um, sort of a recap of what she already talked about. So we are talking about triple negative breast cancers today. And one of the things that she um, stated today that I didn't know is that um, if someone with triple negative breast cancer remains in remission or NED, no evidence of active disease or no evidence of disease beyond five years, they're less likely to have a recurrence than um, other breast cancer types. Um, unfortunately, we tend to lead with the negatives, right? And so whenever I've heard someone talk about triple negative breast cancer or whenever um, people are sharing, hey, how are you? Whenever people are sharing, happy Wednesday, y'all. Whenever people are sharing about triple negative breast cancer, they tend to lead with the negative. And, you know, yes, it is aggressive. And yes, it can be diagnosed at uh, much later stages. And yes, there are less treatment options after chemo and surgery and radiation, right? There's not the hormone suppression available. There's not the Herceptin available like there is for someone with a HER2 positive breast cancer. But there is um, available to those patients um, just sort of the that added peace of mind, right? In that it's less likely to occur, that it's more responsive to chemotherapy because of its aggressive nature in comparison to other um, breast cancers. So while we don't like having breast cancer, while we hate the disease itself, for those of us who are living, breathing, navigating this life with breast cancer, or just knowing and understanding that we're at risk for breast cancer, um, 
you know, we need something to hang on to. We need that that light along this hard, dark road, right? So I'm so grateful for her for sharing that. And I love these lives for that reason, because we learn something new every single day. Um, and for as much expertise as we may have, whether it's being a healthcare provider or a researcher, or whether it's being someone who just has lived this life and walked in these shoes, um, we can all learn something new every single day. So I'm always open to learning. I've always um, lead with the understanding that I don't know everything um, and that it's important to know our limitations and stay in our own lanes, right? And to remember, sometimes we're speaking from the experience of an expert. Sometimes we're just speaking from the experience of an advocate or a patient or a survivor or a thriver or a metavivor, but somebody can teach us something we didn't know all the time. So I see that our doctor has come back on. So I'm pulling her back into the conversation with us. And hopefully um, she comes up on the live. There she goes. Hi, so sorry. I think no, we ran out of battery. They had, to get a, okay. <laughs> they had to get a cord to help me plug it up. So sorry about that. That's okay. No apologies. So I was just recapping and just sharing um, my gratitude for you being on with us and for what you've shared with us so far. Um, yeah. So before we got, um, was there anything else that you wanted to say before we yeah, move um, to the next question? Yeah, yeah, no, I was saying, cause you, we were talking about, um, you know, genetic testing mm -hmm. and having to advocate. Luckily, you know, there's gonna be less need for that because mm -hmm. the, all the guidelines have changed in the past month as far as genetic testing goes. Uh, and because of the um, of the therapeutic advances uh, related to genetics mm -hmm. um, that we're about to discuss, um, the guidelines now recommend that everybody with triple negative breast cancer get genetic testing. Um, every and then everybody with uh, a locally advanced breast cancer should also be considered for genetic testing because these the, these have implications. Uh, for um, drugs that we can use if they have certain gene mutations. Oh, that's fantastic news. Um, you know, if the guidelines are that clear and it's no longer left to, you know, provider discretion, um, then it just makes it easier for folks to get what they need. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And I'm glad to learn about that update because that's something that I wasn't aware of. So yeah, no, it just, it just happened. <laughs> Yeah, so that's awesome. But again, that's why you're here because you're the expert. And, you know, it's not my lane. It wouldn't be something that I would have known or that's going to come across my desk as an infectious disease doctor. Um, so thank you. So um, that's a great segue into our next question in terms of recent therapeutic advances in triple negative breast cancer. Like what um, new advances are specific um, to triple negative breast cancer and its um, different treatment modalities? Yeah. Um, so I would say in the past three to four years, there, there have been a lot of changes and advances. Um, starting in like 2017, we started um, using more what we call neoadjuvant chemotherapy for, for earlier stages of triple negative breast cancer. Um, and I have a little signal issue, I think. soon as it starts getting juicy, it's like the technology just starts to mess with us, right? Because um, I kind of felt myself leaning in when she said there's new advances in the last three to four years. And, you know, talking about, um, you know, new neoadjuvant therapies. So um, our conversation is going to continue. We're going to get through this and we're going to get all this information to you all because there's so much to talk about. We're going to talk about neoadjuvant chemo and what that means. We're going to talk about PARP inhibitors. We're going to talk about immunotherapy and we're going to talk about others. And so I'm so excited for us to be able to continue this conversation with Dr. Ergel. And let's see. Um, someone has a question and our question will definitely be answered during this point of the conversation. But the question from the Liz May, thank you for your question is, do you have any thoughts or experiences with Olaparib 
or PARP inhibitors specifically with the BRCA1 gene. So we'll definitely, definitely um, get that question answered. And our good doctor is coming back on. There she is. Hi, I'm so sorry. No know. apologies. <laughs> no apologies. Yeah, so we were talking about, um, you know, the advances and pretty much um, a lot of advancements have happened since 2017 in this uh, interval negative specifically, and they've all kind of happened back to back. Um, you know, like I was saying before, the only treatment before was just chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And some of these advances have been chemotherapy related and others have been the addition of more targeted therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2017, for example, we, uh, there was a, a, a study that basically if you give the chemo before surgery, you know, traditionally we've always done surgery first. This is for uh, earlier stages of breast cancer. Uh, usually it was surgery first and then chemotherapy to reduce the risk of relapse. Um, well, um, this trial, uh, basically, if you give the, if you, if you gave the chemo before, then did the surgery and at the time of surgery, there was still, there's still some cancer, um, that didn't respond to the chemo fully, even if it was a small amount, then adding, um, uh, adjuvant Zolota, um, or capecitabine, um, uh, it's the same drug. Um, after surgery, um, dramatically improved the, the, the risk of recurrence and overall survival. Mm -hmm. So based on that, pretty much whenever a patient has triple negative breast cancer, as long as their tumor is greater than one or two centimeters, um, we recommend that chemo would be given first. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a big change that's been happening in the past few years um, as far as chemo goes. Um, another one is that we've been using more platinum chemotherapy mm -hmm. um, for negative, um, particularly if there's a BRCA uh, mutation. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is because they, they have found that, you know, triple negatives and BRCA mutant, mutants are uh, more sensitive to platinum drugs. Mm -hmm. um, but the re current recommendation is only, again, if we use it before um, surgery, which is the way we're doing things now anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so those are kind of two, two changes um, as far as chemo. And then the third and, and final change as far as chemo goes, uh, there was a, a, a trial in 2017. And basically, you know, the, the anthracyclines, which is what um, a lot of uh, patients call the red devil, which mm -hmm. is, it's a pretty strong chemotherapy. Um, and, you know, we, part of what we do in, in, in oncology is that we not only try to advance, um, you know, the, the, the effect of the cancer treatment, but also peel back if we don't think that it's needed. So we do a lot of trials with chemotherapy to see is, is this strong chemo actually needed. Mm -hmm. um, and we found um, that using anthracyclines was actually very beneficial in triple negative so before it was kind of like, you know, maybe we should use it, but we weren't sure since it, since this study was uh, published in 2017, uh, we definitely should be using uh, the anthracyclines for triple negative. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's as far as chemo goes. And that's mm -hmm. just one small, um, you know, one small subset of the advances. Um, I would say the more, the even more exciting advancements have been uh, with targeted therapy and mm -hmm. immunotherapy. Uh, both. Um, and you, um, I'll start with immunotherapy. You know, immunotherapy has been around for quite a few years now. It started uh, primarily with melanomas and mm -hmm. then um, lung cancer. Um, and they have dramatically improved and changed the landscape of oncology um, because we've discovered that maybe we don't need this shotgun approach of chemotherapy drugs for all cancer. Mm -hmm. um, we can use immunotherapy. So what immunotherapy is, it's, it's, a, it's a drug, it's still given intravenously, but it's not chemo. And again, it's not a shotgun approach of just ki randomly killing cells. Mm -hmm. Immune system to fight the cancer as if the cancer were a virus. Um, so it recognizes the cancer as something foreign and, and, and kills the cancer. Um, so that's immunotherapy. It's been used in other cancer subtypes um, for a while, but it wasn't mm -hmm. um, started to be used in breast cancer, yeah. specifically triple negative breast cancer only at this point um, until last year. Um, and last year we started using... Oh, wow. um, mm -hmm. oh 
always when it starts getting juicy. Here comes the technology, but it's all good. All right. All right. There you go. We hear you. All right. Yeah. Um, so the, um, I was saying immunotherapy, um, and we started using it last year um, in the metastatic setting. Uh, there, uh, last year, two drugs were approved, atezolizumab and pembrolizumab. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, as of like a month or two ago, it got approved, FDA approved for earlier stages of breast cancer, as long as they uh, oh, triple negative breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Are you there with me? Sorry. Yeah, I hear you. Yep. It keeps it keeps moving up. Okay. Did you lose me at any point? Yeah. So you were um, starting to talk about the. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Olent Olentizumab. <laughs> um, atezolizumab and oh, pembrolizumab. Okay. Yes. Are they were both. Yeah, they were both approved last year for mm -hmm. metastatic uh, triple negative breast cancer. Um, that has a specific. Uh, um, uh, receptor that is that is detected. So not all triple negatives have this. Uh, it's called a PDL1 um, receptor, okay. um, and a portion, a good portion of triple negative breast cancers have that. And and if we if you have it, then you're a candidate for either atezolizumab or pembrolizumab. Okay. Um, what are the um, brand names of those? Because a lot of times we talk in brand names, and I know yeah. you're using generics, yeah, yeah. which is how we talk behind the scenes. Yes, uh, atezolizumab is tocentric. Okay. And pembrolizumab is Keytruda. Oh, Keytruda. Okay. Because someone yeah. had a question about the Keytruda in BRCA1 positive yeah. patients. Is there something specific with that as well beyond if, the, the metastatic patients? Yeah. If they have triple negative, um, mm -hmm. you know, and again, there's an association with, with BRCA and, and, and triple negative. So if, if you have triple negative, a decent chance that you have BRCA1, but it's not, the indication is not for BRCA. The indication is for okay. triple negative, who uh, positive for PDL one. So okay. you know, good chance that if you have BRCA, that may be the case, but but that has to be the case. You have to be triple negative with PDL one positivity. Yeah. So the therapy is very targeted, as you mentioned, um, for a specific inhibitor on the, or a specific receptor rather on the cancer. Yeah. Cell. Right. Yeah, and it's actually um, it's. It basically, it's, it's, it's a little bit complex to explain, but it's, if you have that, that means the cancer has gotten smart um, and knows how to suppress your immune system. If you have that PD-L1 wow. um, and knows how to suppress your immune system. So if you suppress that PD-L1, then the cancer can no longer tell your immune system, don't attack me. Um, and then it, it reactivates your immune system to fight against the cancer. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so that's immunotherapy. Um, this year, um, I, I, like I said, just a couple of months ago, it was um, also approved in earlier stages of triple negative, um, and regardless of PDL one. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that was about two months ago, um, but only for high risk uh, earlier stages, meaning if they are large enough, lar usually larger than two centimeters, um, and or have positive lymph nodes. So not not every triple negative. Okay, got it. Um, someone inquired about how is PDL one tested for um, that. I'm assuming that would be testing the actual cancer cells themselves. Yes, yes, it's not a blood test or anything like that. It's not genetics. Um, it's something that the the pathologists actually do um, on the tumor. Um, you know, on the tumor slide, um, they try to stain for the receptor and they see it with something called immunohistochemistry. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then. Um, I got two questions, or maybe it's one question. So someone asked, um, after neoadjuvant chemo, um, is there a particular preference for Zelota versus Olaparib um, for triple negative breast cancer with people who have BRCA1 mutations, or are those two distinct issues? That's a very good question. Kind of getting a little bit ahead of what, what I haven't <laughs> talked about yet. Um, so let me, before I answer that question, is there, are there any more immunotherapy questions? Let's see. I... I don't see any other immunotherapy okay. um, questions and it kind of had a little overlap. So I guess we'll talk about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let me talk about, let me talk about BRCA mutations and, and PARP inhibitors. Sure. One of which is Olaparib, the other one's Um Basically, you know, in, um, in, 
2018, um, Olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor, is when it was first approved in breast cancer. Before it had been used in ovarian cancer with germline uh, BRCA1 mutations. I say germline because germline, what, it, what that means is that it's a mutation that's inherited from, you know, from family, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to a somatic mutation because BRCA mutations can also happen in the tumor itself. So the, the patient um, as a person doesn't have a BRCA mutation, but the tumor within the breast developed a BRCA mutation. Wow. Um, and that's a somatic mutation. So there's a difference there. Um, and right now, PARP inhibitors are approved for germline mutations only at this time. Okay. Um, so in 2018, uh, Olaparib was approved in the metastatic setting for patients who have uh, BRCA1 uh, or 2 mutations um, and are HER2 negative. That's just the way the study was done. So that's the way it's approved. Okay. Um, and um, and after that, telesoperib came came on, and then just this year, it was another exciting thing that happened this year, um, about um, about two months ago, it got approved in the adjuvant setting for earlier stages of breast cancer. Um, specifically, the, the the biggest change in, in benefit was in, seen in triple negative. Um, some ben some decent benefit was seen in in hormone positive. Um, but basically, that's what changed that now for all triple negatives and um, otherwise some high risk hormone positive, they should get genetic testing because if they happen to have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, they can benefit from either uh, Olaparib for the most part because uh, in, the, in the earlier um, uh, stages, it's only Olaparib at this point that's approved. Okay. Um, and uh, and basically, you know, you, you take Olaparib and, and that has uh, decreased the, the rates of recurrence. And based on that, it was approved. Um, the question that was asked, I'll repeat it, is, is there a preference for um, Xaloda, which is the first one that I talked about, um, mm -hmm. if there's, if there's um, um, a residual disease after, you know, neoadjuvant chemo and surgery versus Olaparib? And the answer is we don't know. <laughs> um, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of questions out there, and, and this happens a lot of breast in breast cancer. We there's so many studies, and it's it's only going to keep on happening more. There's so many studies that they don't, you know, studies that were done concurrently, and mm -hmm. you know, new findings have have been found, and they don't necessarily. Ha, you know, we don't have the answers to everything because they didn't test for all the question and every single question that we have. So while the Zalota test, the Zalota trial was going on, you know, the, the Olaparib trial was going on at the same time. And then they, they both have positive studies. And the only way that we would ever know which one is better is to uh, have a study that compares them up against one another. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no such study right now. Maybe one day they'll, you know, they'll, they'll work on that. But right now the guidelines pretty much say, um, that we don't know. Um, and, you know, this has been a topic of uh, a, a, a pretty good topic of discussion been, uh, among oncologists. And um, I can tell you, I know some oncologists that are probably planning to sequence them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that the, 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 if you do Zalota, it's only for about six months. Um, you know, so maybe if they have, and, and, and there's a lot of factors to, to consider as well. And that, that those factors include the the, the how locally advanced the breast cancer was. So for instance, if the breast cancer was a large tumor um, or a lot of lymph nodes involved, you really mm -hmm. want to give that patient a maximum amount of therapy to reduce the risk of recurrence. Um, or if the, the tumor really didn't respond very well to chemo, um, and then at the time of surgery, there was, still, there was still a large amount of residual disease, that's another patient that you want to do the maximum amount for. for. So for somebody like that, I can see uh, oncologists, you know, sequencing the Zalota um, and, and Olaparib. How the sequence goes, again, nobody knows. Uh, you know, I, I assume a lot of people would probably do the, the, the Zalota first because it's only six months and then, and then kind of follow with the Olaparib. Mm -hmm. um, but then for somebody who, is, who started with a smaller tumor, maybe no negative, or the residual disease was very minimal, mm -hmm. um, maybe you kind of want to minimize things. But if, in my, you know, in my kind of theoretically speaking, in, in my medical opinion, and again, this is just a medical opinion, nothing based on an actual study, which is how we otherwise make formal opinions. Mm -hmm. on. Um, in, in my medical opinion, if you have a BRCA uh, mutation, you know, the, the elaborate is much more, more targeted. And if you were to choose, that's probably what I would choose in my clinic. Okay. But yeah. if it's somebody with a lot of tumor burden, mm -hmm. I, I may sequence them. It'll be in like case by case. Okay, got it.
All right. Um, maybe this ties together or maybe it doesn't, but it, um, it definitely relates to something we spoke about a little earlier in the conversation. So Ms. Savannah Townsend asked the question, um, can you please ask the doctor about what impact having a radiological complete response on imaging during chemo means for the likelihood of having a complete pathological response um, at the time of surgery? And then um, I'll add to that, I was going to ask um, about um, the fact that uh, neoadjuvant chemo is preferred in triple negative patients, and then they have surgery. And I know, um, you know, we share with all this great joy and excitement that someone has had a complete pathologic response when they ultimately undergo surgery. Is that something that's also predictive of their long term prognosis? Can we make any predictions or assumptions based on that? You mean the radiologic complete response? Yeah. Or the pathologic? Yeah, both really. Both. So okay. The, the question from the um, person in our audience was, is the, path the radiologic complete response um, predictive of having a pathological complete response? I think that's their question. Yeah. Um, theoretically, yes. Um, you know, in practice, we don't apply that. Um, yeah. There are um, trials undergoing that I know of from even from my fellowship, these were going on, but you know, trials can take uh, even decades to, mm -hmm. to find the results to come out um, to see if, you know, if somebody has had a complete response, can we actually omit surgery? And, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, and we only know that because we've seen results of, you know, of the surgery the, how it, and how it correlates with the, with the um, neg essentially a negative image, whether that's a mammogram, ultrasound, or MRI. Um, right now, there is no, no evidence for that. So right now, even okay. if you have a negative image, you still have to go to surgery because surgery is the gold standard. Mm -hmm. It's the only way to know for sure that there's no cancer cells there because, you know, mm -hmm. imaging is limited. It's, it's a picture. So it's essentially yep. a picture. <laughs> Um, and you can only see so much from a picture. You still otherwise have to look at it under the microscope yep. to actually see cancer cells. Um, you can't see the actual cells on imaging. So there's no mm -hmm. way to know without um, getting surgery. So at this time, you have to get surgery. Even if, and, and you know, radiologic complete response is still a great uh, prognostic indicator. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if the cancer responded that well that you no longer see it on, on uh, imaging. Um, that is a great sign that not only that cancer cells respond in the breast, but if potentially a cancer cell was, you know, uh, um, kind of circulating around the bloodstream, mm -hmm. um, that cancer cell, every cancer cell out there would have responded to it, which, which kind of lends for a very uh, great prognosis. Yeah. Um, and then if that's confirmed with a pathologic complete response, meaning that by the time we did the surgery and we took out the breast tissue and we looked at the breast tissue under the microscope, there was no breast cancer left. It was all killed by the chemotherapy that was given. That is, a, that is, that is for sure that we know, we've done studies on that, uh, that a pathologic complete response correlates with better survival. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. That's what I thought. But again, I want to stay in my lane. And so I um, wanted to make sure that they hear it directly from yes. you, the expert. So thank you so much for answering that question. Yeah. So um, I think we have a couple of other things to cover in terms of therapeutic advances, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's, so we mentioned immunotherapy, we mentioned chemotherapy, we mentioned uh, PARP inhibitors, and there is um, Tridelvi, which is the brand name, uh, or Sesituzumab um, is the generic name. And that was approved, um, I think, last year or a year or two ago. Um, and that is also another form of target therapy, uh, more specifically. And there's, there's a lot of nomenclature that can be very confusing to patients because mm -hmm. sometimes people call this immunotherapy. But technically, for us oncologists that know what immunotherapy actually is, it's not immunotherapy. Got it. um, it's, so more strictly speaking, is antibody drug conjugates. And so what that is, it's an antibody that attaches to a protein that has been found in over uh, in a lot of cancers, um, not just not just triple negative breast cancer, but specifically in triple negative breast cancer, over 90% of breast cancers have this trope to um, protein trans it's a transmember protein that basically helps the cancer cells proliferate and, and multiply and survive. 
Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a protein that's present in all cells, but more particularly in certain cancer subtypes. And again, in triple negative, it's, been, it, it's, it's kind of ubiqu ubiquitous. So um, targeting this trope too, um, and, and cells that have this protein um, can, it has been found to be very effective. So the antibody drug conjugate uh, or Tridel-B, what it is, is it targets the, the, the trop 2 uh, containing cancer cells with an antibody that attaches to that. And then the antibody is attached to a, a small chemotherapy molecule. And then it delivers the chemotherapy molecule, uh, ideally or you know, for the most part, only to the cells that have this trop 2 mm -hmm. um, So it's, it's, it's targeted therapy because it only, it's only going to the trop 2 um, technically speaking, it's, you know, it has a chemotherapy molecule, but in the mm -hmm. traditional sense of chemotherapy, um, I don't like to call it chemotherapy because it's not that shotgun approach Got it. of killing every single cell out there. It's really only targeting the, the ones that have the trope 2 molecule. Okay. Um, so that was approved in the metastatic setting for, uh, for triple negative breast cancer. You don't have to do any testing because the, again, over 90% of the triple negative breast cancer cells will have it. Okay. Um, so you don't have to do any testing base, uh, but it is for recurrent um, mm -hmm. uh, tr uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So first you would have to do chemotherapy or if there's a BRCA mutation, you know, you do a lab or, or telcelcarib. And then if there's recurrence, you can consider Trudelby. So that has been um, a big change. Um, um, recently, there was another kind of more follow-up study in that study. In, uh, and, and we're talking about recurrent triple negative breast cancer, which mm -hmm. otherwise carries, you know, not a great prognosis. Right. Um, and it was found that in these patients who use Tridelby, even in the second line setting, that doubled their overall survival. Okay. Wow. So, so it was pretty effective. Yeah. That's great to hear. That's really good news. We certainly need that. Um, yeah. And when we're talking about triple negative breast cancer. Yeah. yeah. But I think that's it. I think I covered. Uh, yeah, you covered such a great deal for us today. Um, it's been a fantastic conversation. Um, it's been very eye opening. And I think, you know, where we don't often have a lot of positive things to say, you shed a, a lot of positive light on um, you know, some of the clinical approaches to triple negative breast cancer and some of the new advances in terms of um, prolonging life in those who are surviving with metastatic or recurrent triple negative breast cancer. So um, we're so grateful for your time. Um, right. Sorry okay for the to... logistical difficulties. Oh, it's totally <laughs> okay. Is it okay to just take a moment and see if anybody else has of a course. question of course. before we sign off? Yeah, of course. And while um, we're waiting to hear from any questions, um, I know that um, you're presenting from um, Memorial Hospital, but are you active on social media? Is there a place where our audience can follow you? Um, and if so, can you give us that information or maybe drop it in the chat as well? Um, and you, we certainly want to thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise with us today. Yeah. I am not that technologically savvy, <laughs> so I'm actually, as, as a physician, I'm not, I'm not in, in social media, but okay. maybe I should. I know the, the, the medical, you know, the medical world is um, very much active, mostly on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, it's where mo most of the medical, you know, the, the, med the physicians are, in, are at, but um, I, I, need to, I need to get in on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you so much um, for sharing your time and expertise. Um, I don't see any um, questions that have come up in the chat or the question box. So if you want to give us any last um, parting words about triple negative breast cancer, and then we'll let you get back to what I'm certain is a busy day because there's tons of patients out there that need you. Yeah. No, overall, you know, lots of exciting, especially I think this, this talk, this discussion is like, couldn't be like, you know, better timed. Because um, mm -hmm. as I've kind of gone over, it's uh, lots of exciting advancements in specifically triple negative, not just triple negative, you know, we could have one on HER2 positive breast cancer, well, lots of advances there too. But in triple negative, even as, you know, as recently as a month ago, <laughs> Um, lots, lots of advancements, lots of changes in the, the sequence of treatment, uh, targeting the treatment, the fact that now um, genetic testing is much more wide open to a lot of patients, um, you know, if, if they either have triple negative or if they have um, advanced disease um, at presentation. 
um, because we're able to target um, things now. But you know, lots of excitement and I'm happy to be part of this and, and educate everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ergel. Um, we definitely appreciate you and we appreciate Cherry down in the chat. She dropped some links for us. So there's mhs.net slash cancer and then there's memorialcancerinstitute.com where you guys can check out some more information um, and stay connected with us over here on Brock is Strong um, where we are helping women who are affected by breast cancer or have a risk uh, for breast cancer. And that's regardless of gene mutation status. We're just helping get the word out about uh, breast cancer helping women to um, survive and thrive through their diagnosis and we're just helping to educate everyone along the way um, so thank you so much again to memorial hospital memorial cancer institute um, for linking up with us thank you dr ergo for your time and thank you everyone who joined us and who dropped questions you all have a wonderful day and thank you so much for your time and attention thank you thank you bye-bye